Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this next session in exploring LDS history, where I know I say every week, I am honestly doing the best I can to be gr as gracious as I can possibly be in every lesson, uh, to be loving and to be kind to our LDS friends and neighbors, uh, even though that we disagree a lot on a lot of these issues and we disagree in a major way. I want to be loving and kind and gracious, but at the same time, I want to be honest with what history teaches us about the truth of the, uh, the founding of the LDS Church. And I think it is possible to be gracious and it's possible to disagree without being disagreeable. And I, I hope I find that balance as we continue through this uh, every week together. So we looked in recent weeks at the testimony of the three witnesses Oliver Cowdery and Martin Harris and David Whitmer that's found at the beginning of the Book of Mormon. Today we come to the testimony of the second set of witnesses, and that is the eight witnesses. And I'm going to be honest, this was probably the most difficult lesson for me to prepare thus far in this series. And I struggled and I wrestled a great deal because there's, looking at it historically speaking, there's just not a whole lot there. And what there is there to try to piece it together in, in statements and things that, 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 don't, that contradict and don't line up, it was just hard to piece together kind of a cohesive timeline. And I wanted to do more than just go, well, we have these eight witnesses, and this guy lived then and died then and lived then and died then. And so to try to put together a little bit, um, hopefully I have been able to do that. I think we saw at the end that I, at least I, 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 I can't with any confidence place my confidence in the testimony of the three witnesses, and I end up in the same place with the eight witnesses, but it's just a little bit more work getting there. So to put it all in the timeline and in the per historical perspective, on June 28th, 1829, that's when the three witnesses had their experience where they said an angel appeared to them and showed them uh, the golden plates. And that happened at the Whitmer Farm in New York. Not long after that, the Smith and Whitmer families traveled to Joseph Smith Sr.'s home and in Palmyra, New York. And about a month later, on July 2nd, 1829, somewhere near the Smith home, that's when the eight witnesses allegedly saw and handled the golden plates for themselves. And the big difference between these two sets of witnesses is the three witnesses, it was a supernatural experience where, you know, an angel appeared to them from heaven and showed them the plates. The eight witnesses, according to their testimony, it was much more of a physical experience where there's no angels involved. Joseph Smith pulled out the plates and handed, the, handed them to them and let them see them and touch them. And so their testimony, as it's recorded in the Book of Mormon, and this is a copy of the manuscript that went to the printer um, of their testimony. This is what they said that they witnessed. So the statement at the beginning of the Book of Mormon says, Be it known unto all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people unto whom this work shall come, that Joseph Smith, Jr., the author and proprietor of this work, has shown unto us the plates of which hath been spoken, which have the appearance of gold, and as many of the leaves as the said Smith has translated, we did handle with our hands. They're saying, we, we touched them. We also saw the engravings thereon, all of which has the appearance of ancient work and of curious workmanship. This we bear record with words of soberness that the said Smith has shown unto us, for we have seen and we have hefted. So we, got, we touched the plates, we held the plates for ourselves. And we know of a surety that the said Smith has got the plates of which we have spoken, and we give our names unto the world to witness unto the world that which we have seen, and we lie not, God-bearing witness. And these eight men signed that statement. Christian Whitmer, Jacob Whitmer, Peter Whitmer, Jr., John Whitmer, Hiram Page, Joseph Smith, Sr., Hiram Smith, and Samuel Smith. So... Several things you might notice right off the bat when you look at that. You'll notice that all of the signatures on this document, it's, it is not signed by the witnesses themselves. And this is the printer's copy that went to the printer, but you can see, you don't have to be a handwriting expert to, to see, 
That's the same person's handwriting for all eight of those, right? All of the Whitbers are identical. All of the Smiths are written identically. So it's not their handwriting. And um, this is all Oliver Cowdery wrote this statement, who was the scribe for the Book of Mormon. He wrote it, and he put all of their names on it. Now, the argument would be this is the printer's copy. This is not the original document. This is the printer's copy. A copy was made that they gave to the printer. We don't have the original document. You might remember it was placed in the cornerstone of a house in Nauvoo, Illinois, that later uh, was flooded, and most of that original document, the water destroyed it. And so nobody uh, has the original document. But there's no evidence at all that any of the eight witnesses actually signed any kind of statement. There's no place where any of the eight ever said, yes, I signed it myself. Um, what's really interesting, though, to me is this, is this is a monumentous occasion in their lives, you would think, right? Um, and they had been pestering Joseph Smith about, when do we get to see the plates? We want to see the plates. Can I see the plates? Can I see the plates? Um, they had been hounding him about it, and they finally get to see them, and not one of them mentions it in, in their private journal or, or anywhere else. And you would just think, if there's anything you're going to record, right? I don't, and, you know, some of us are better at journaling at others, and I don't know if you journal. I'm, I've been sporadically tried it in my life, and I'm lousy at it. Because you find you end up a whole lot of days are just like all the other days. <laughs> and you're going, I'm just writing the same thing today that I wrote yesterday, got up, went to work, fed the kids, right? And um, so I, you would think anything unusual like this, if you're going to write about it, you would. And none of them um, ever did. You probably also noticed a lot of those names were really si uh, similar. So three of the eight witnesses were related to Joseph Smith. His dad, Joseph Smith Sr., and two of his brothers, Hiram Smith and Samuel Smith. All of the rest of the five of the eight witnesses were all Whitmers. Uh, Christian Whitmer, Jacob Whitmer, Peter Whitmer, and John Whitmer were all brothers. And Hiram Page was married to a Whitmer sister. So he was a brother-in-law. And when you put it all together, of the 11, the three witnesses and the eight, of the 11 witnesses... All of them, with the exception of Martin Harris, who you might remember was the financial backer for the entire project. He was the money man behind it. The other ten were all either Whitmers or Smiths, which doesn't prove, prove things one way or the other, right? That's, you, uh, you can't say, oh, well, that wasn't real. They're all related. But it certainly doesn't, at least doesn't sit well. I would feel better if some other people from the outside of this one tight-knit little group had said something. And um, Mark Twain had kind of the same impression, and he's writing very tongue-in-cheek the way Mark Twain often did. After he visited Utah and was given a copy of the Book of Mormon and read it, he wrote, And when I am far on the road to conviction, and eight men, be they grammatical or otherwise, come forward and tell me they have seen the plates too, and not only seen those plates, but hefted them, I am convinced. I couldn't feel more satisfied uh, if the rest of the entire Whitmer, Whitmer family <laughs> had signed it. <laughs> and so he is obviously being a little snarky, but I at least understand his, his point of view. Uh, the fact that they were all from two families, that does nothing to prove. If, if it really happened, it really happened whether they, all of them were related or whether all of them were Smiths. But it would be nice if we had some corroboration from somebody other uh, than these two families. Um, part of the difficulty with the eight witnesses is we have very few statements from them later on regarding what they saw. And a lot of the ones we do, they are like, they suggest that it was more of a supernatural experience, and we'll see some of that in a little bit. Even Joseph Smith himself, um, in, in his history, uh, we looked at it. He went into great detail about what happened the day the three witnesses had their experience. And we went in the woods, and Moroni appeared to us, and Martin Harris, you know, nobody showed up at first, so Martin Harris went off by himself. And he gave us all of this detail about the events that happened, and he wrote nothing about the experience and how it went down with the eight witnesses. All there is is the statement that's in the Book of Mormon. 
There's no account from Joseph Smith where on this day at my house we went in the woods and God told me I could show him the plates. And I, There's just no description from any of the witnesses really at any point later in their life where they describe what actually happened. But to be fair, none of the, none of the eight ever denied their testimony. None of them ever said it didn't happen. Uh, they all later affirmed that what was printed in the Book of Mormon is true, but there's no place where any of them, they never described the events at any point, uh, except for one account, which we'll look at in just a few minutes. But there's very little place where you would think they would have been told somebody, a reporter, a friend, somewhere that it would have been written down somewhere along the way where, you know, I was talking to Christian Whitmer, and he told me all about when they saw the eight plates. There's none of that. Uh, recorded anywhere from any of the witnesses. In fact, for Christian Whitmer and Jacob Whitmer and Peter Whitmer and Joseph Smith Sr., we have zero statements at all from them regarding their experience with the plates. So half of the eight, we have, there's nothing that they said about the plates at a later, later date. Um, so there's, there's silence from four of the eight outside of this statement uh, in the Book of Mormon. And there are very few statements from the other witnesses that are anything more than just affirmation of what's in the Book of Mormon. That, yes, I, I maintain that testimony, or yes, that's true, but nothing in terms of any kind of detail or anything where they explained what happened. The one exception is from John Whitmer, who lived longer than any of the other uh, eight witnesses, this is David's brother, so you might remember uh, David from a few weeks ago. He was one of the three witnesses. He lived uh, well into the 1870s also. John Whitmer lived until uh, 1877, and towards the end of his life, this uh, Mormon fellow, Dr. P. Wilhelm Polson, uh, traveled from Utah to Missouri, where the Whitmers were living, uh, to interview them. Uh, Polson was from Ogden, so yay, Ogden gets our first mention in the story. He was from Ogden, and he traveled uh, to w interview them, and then later published, uh, his interviews were published in the Deseret News in 1878. Now, there's a lot of controversy surrounding this particular interview and how factual Polson was. Um, John Whitmer died before this interview was ever published, so he never had a chance to contradict it. But while Polson was there, he also interviewed David Whitmer. And when th their interview was published, David was still alive, and he very strongly said, I never said half of those things that he's saying I said in this interview. And so at least he didn't agree with what Polson wrote and said it wasn't factual. We don't know whether that's true with John or not. But I want to, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Um, even there's a lot of controversy around this. We'll give him the interview. But I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Here's what Whitmer said in that interview. Uh, so Paulson says, your name is affixed to the testimony in the Book of Mormon that you saw the plates. And Whitmer says, that's so. That testimony is true, what's in the Book of Mormon. Did you handle the plates with your hands? I did then they were a material substance. Yes, as material as anything can be. Were they heavy to lift? Yes, and as you know, gold is a heavy metal. They were very heavy. How big were the leaves? As far as I recall, they were about eight by six or seven inches. Were they thick? Yes, just so thick that characters could be engraven on both sides. How were they joined together? With three wings, one in the shape of a D with a straight line towards the center. And what place did you see the plates? We saw them in Joseph Smith's house. He had them there. That's really important. Did you see them covered with a cloth? And you might remember from earlier, the other statements like Harris and people said, he had the plates, they were on a the table, they were always covered with a cloth. We never actually saw the plates. He says, nope, I saw them uncovered, handed into our hands. We turned the leaves sufficient to satisfy us. Were all eight witnesses present at the same time? No. At that time, Joseph Smith showed the plates to us. We were four persons present in the room, and at another time, he showed them to four other persons, which is an interesting detail to give. Almost any depiction you see is like the picture I was showing you earlier, the eight witnesses out in the woods all looking at them. 
He says, no, it happened in the house, and he only showed them to four of us, and then later he showed them to um, four others. What's interesting to me, especially about the timing of this interview, is that, like I said, we have, this is the most detail we have from any witness regarding how it went down. And, and I can't prove this is, just, just, this is just me theorizing. Why are they all so silent? Why doesn't somebody say something more other than, yes, what it says is true? Well, if you've ever told a lie, you know, one person can tell a lie and get away with it. But if eight people are telling a lie, it's hard for them all to tell the same story if you're, something never happened, right? Well, what had happened by 1877? He was the only one of the eight left. So there was nobody to tell a different story at that point in time. And I don't know if that weighs in at all. Like I said, that's just my theory. But I can't understand how if eight witnesses are all going to put our name on something, but we all start describing what actually happened, and I tell a different story than you tell, and you tell it slightly story different than I tell, it's going to become obvious that we're making it up. I don't know if that's the case or not, but I do find it curious that we don't have anything until this point uh, from any of the eight witnesses. One other thing that's really important in this testimony, he says it happened in the house and it happened in two groups of four people that we saw the plates. This totally contradicts one of the other accounts we have that comes from Joseph Smith's mother who was there when this happened. It happened in her home. Lucy Mack Smith, Joseph's mom, her account and her history that she wrote, she gave it like this. And this is one of the very few that give us any details at all. She said, all of the male part of the company repaired to a little grove where it was customary for the family to offer up their secret prayers. As Joseph had been instructed that the plates would be carried there by one of the ancient Nephites, which I find interesting. If we trust this one and you've got the plates in the house and you're translating them, but no, 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 no need for you to carry them there. One of the ancient Nephites will show up and carry them there. And so they go out in the woods and they found them in a stump and he showed them to them. Here it was that those eight witnesses recorded in the Book of Mormon looked upon the plates and handled them of which they bear witness in the following words. And then she gives a reprint of the statement from the Book of Mormon. So I don't, I don't know a lot, but I know that this can't be true and this be true. I, somebody's wrong there. It either happened in the house four at a time or it happened in the woods eight at a time, all of them together, but both of those statements can't be true. And both of these people were there when this happened. So somebody's wrong or misremembering at the very least. And this is why I say it's hard to line out what actually went down because the few sources we do have, they don't line up very well. If we come back to John Whitmer's interview with Polson, Polson wrapped it up uh, asking Whitmer, uh, why, why aren't you a part of the church? Because Whitmer had left the church and denounced Joseph Smith as a fallen prophet uh, in 1838. And so in interviewing him, why don't you if, you, if your testimony is true, why don't you join the church? He said, I have a testimony within me. And that testimony I got when I was raised up as a witness. That testimony has never left my bosom. It is by me to this day. And I am in the very place where I have to be, according to the Book of Mormon, which is the law that came out of Zion, which center stake is never to be taken away from here in Jackson County, Missouri. He had a firm and most absolute faith in the restoration and triumph of Zion on this continent and the building of temples and independence in far west Missouri. That's just an interesting statement to me because he was convinced that the, you know, he left the church denounced Joseph Smith as a fallen prophet, but never denied his testimony. In the early teaching of the church, you might recall we've talked about, it was a restorationist movement that um, the saints are going to reestablish the kingdom of God in Independence, Missouri, and that's going to be the new Zion, and we're going to reach the Lamanites for Jesus, and Jesus is going to return to the temple in Independence, Missouri within this generation. And so even as an old man, he was convinced this is where Jesus is coming back, and 
all of you Mormons out in Utah <laughs> are wrong. And so if I, that leaves a modern Mormon in a kind of quandary regarding his testimony. Because if he was correct about what he saw, is he correct here? Um, which would mean the main branch of the church is, is in the wrong. One other interesting piece from Whitmer, uh, this is the account that took place in 1839 after Whitmer had left the church. He'd been excommunicated from the church and become part of the group that was known as the dissenters. And um, him and some of the dissenters went to this Mormon named Turley to uh, try to convince him to leave the church and that Joseph Smith was a fallen prophet. And they had this conversation. Turley says to this group of men, uh, gentlemen, I presume there are men here who have heard John Corll say that Mormonism was true, that Joseph Smith was a prophet and inspired of God. I now call upon you, John Whitmer. You say Corll is a moral and good man. Do you believe him when he says the Book of Mormon is true or when he says it's not true? There are many things published that say they are true and again turn around and say they are false. So what do you say? Whitmer asked, do you hint at me? And Turley said, if the cap fits you, wear it. All I know is that you have published to the world that an angel did present those plates to Joseph Smith. So he's going, all right, you've left the church, but it's your testimony. Are you saying, did that happen? So he puts Whitmer on the, he's trying to put him in a hard spot here because he's left the church and he's saying Joseph Smith's a false prophet. Whitmer doesn't back down from his testimony. He, he replied saying, I now say I handled those plates. There were fine engravings on both sides. I handled them. And he described how they were hung and said, they were shown to me by a supernatural power. And he acknowledged all. So that's interesting that he would use that phrase. Um, if this was just a natural physical occurrence that Joseph Smith took out physical plates, that if we had been there, any one of us would have been able to see them, right? If they're actual physical plates and they were sitting on that chair, we would all see them. But he hints here there was some kind of, I saw them through supernatural power. And um, Turley asked him why the translation is not now here. It's not clear. He's asking him, well, if you saw them, is the translation correct? which puts Whitmer in a hard spot because, again, he's, he's saying Joseph Smith's a false prophet, but my testimony in the golden plates is true. So Whitmer's response was, I can't read it. I don't know whether it's true or not. Um, in other words, I saw the plates, but I don't know if what Smith translated is right or not. So he's kind of trying to play both. I did see him, but now that I'm saying Joseph Smith's a false prophet, I can't say that what he translated is correct or not. Let's talk about Hiram for a minute. Hiram Page, uh, one of the A witnesses, one of the original members of the church when the church was founded in April of 1830. Later that year, in September of 1830, Hiram Page dug up a black stone, which he began using as a seer stone. And he began to receive revelations for the church. And t tell me if this sounds familiar, if you've been here in recent weeks. He would look at the stone and it would show him a sentence on paper, and as soon as he wrote one sentence, another sentence came to the stone until he had 16 pages of revelations. Does that sound familiar? That's exactly how Joseph Smith translated the Book of Mormon. Hiram Page starts doing the same thing, and he's got 16 pages of revelations that are mostly about how the church is going to be set up and where Zion's going to be located and how the church is going to be governed in terms of officers and things like that. And he's saying these are communications from God, that's a problem for Joseph Smith's authority if other people are getting revelations from God. In fact, um, all of the Whitmers and Oliver Cowdery, by the way, all believed these revelations were from God. So it put Joseph Smith in a difficult position, and so he prayed about it and um, what we should do. And the revelation he got from God is now recorded in Doctrine and Covenants in one of the LDS Scriptures, Doctrine and Covenants 28, Joseph Smith got this revelation from God. Behold, verily, verily, I say unto thee, this is God speaking, no one shall be appointed to receive commandments and revelations in this church except Joseph Smith, Jr. For he receiveth them even as Moses. 
And again, thou shalt take thy brother Hiram Page between thee and thee, him alone, except for we're going to publish it. Just between the two of you alone and tell him that those things which he hath written from that stone are not from me and that Satan is deceiving him. And so um, Smith said the stone was really a supernatural seer stone, but it was consecrated by the devil and any revelations received from it were from the devil and convinced Page to destroy the stone and the revelations. But it is interesting that this led to the establishment of the doctrine that continues till today that only the prophet can receive revelations for the whole church and not anybody else. And the rest of Doctrine and Covenants talks about, yeah, the Holy Spirit can lead you to do this and that and that, but if it's a revelation, it's got to be from only from Joseph Smith or only from the prophet, they would say, today. So interesting tidbit from Hiram's background, and it shows you, again, all of the Whitmers and all of the Smiths were caught up in this supernatural, cultic worldview where everybody's seeing visions and everybody's having dreams and everybody's having revelations and we're using seer stones and divining rods and all of this kind of stuff. One of the few statements we have from Hiram Page later in life, uh, when John was excommunicated, uh, Hiram also left the church and he eventually became a part of William McClellan's group. You might remember talking about him and his branch, the Church of Christ, that he was trying to start in Kirtland, Ohio. He joins up with that group, and McClellan had written to him about his testimony, and uh, Hiram wrote back, and it was included in the editorials of the Ensign of Liberty, which was um, the Church of Christ, their church paper at the time. And this is his statement starting in the top. And it's lengthy, but I think it's worth reading. He says, you want to know my my faith relative to the Book of Mormon and the winding up of wickedness. As to the Book of Mormon, it should be doing injustice to myself and the work of God of the last days to say I could know a thing to be true in 1830 and know the same thing to be false in 1847. To say that my mind was so treacherous that I had forgotten what I saw. Well, if it was true then, it's true now. So he's not backing down from his statement. To say that a man of Joseph's ability, who at that time did not know how to pronounce the word Nephi, could write a book of 600 pages as correct as the Book of Mormon without supernatural power. And, and notice what he's saying here. He's not giving any details about what happened. He's saying, I, I affirm what's in the Book of Mormon, and isn't it amazing that Joseph Smith could write a book like that? But he's not giving us anything about, I saw him, I touched him, I handled him, and here's how it went down. No details. I just... Uh, I'm not going to back down from the statement there, but he's not giving us anything new other than this. Um, and to say that those holy angels who came and showed themselves to me as I was walking through the field to confirm in me the work of the Lord of the last days, three of whom came to me afterwards and sang a hymn in their own pure language. Yea, it would be there um, treating the God of heaven with contempt to deny these testimonies with too many others to mention them. So that is new information. It gives us nothing about how he saw him, but afterwards some angels appeared and sang to him. So that's a nice thing that happened. And then he answers the second question. He said, you also asked me about whether you really think we've reached the end of time. To the next thing, whether wickedness will be wound up in this generation for the space of a thousand years. And again, early Mormons were a restorationist movement. We're going to usher in the millennium. Jesus is going to come to earth and usher in the thousand-year reign. He's going to do it within this generation. There are serious reasons for believing that it will. Besides those testimonies which have fallen into our hands, we have the gathering of the Jews in Jerusalem. I find it interesting that a lot of people still point to that today. <laughs> 170 years later, we're saying the same, same thing. Any day now, the Jews are gathering in Jerusalem. It is said that a messenger has been sent from the ten tribes, and you might remember that the, the lost ten tribes of Israel for a lot of early Mormons were... You know, they're, they're out there somewhere, and they're waiting for Jesus to come back, and maybe up by the North Pole, a lot of them thought. They're living up north somewhere, and they've been waiting since 600 B.C. for Jesus to return, and then they're going to come back. A messenger has sent, been sent from the ten tribes to see whether the way was prepared for them to come home, which shall, shall agree with these passages in the Bible. The ten tribes, no doubt, have been visited by some messenger to let them know that the time has come for them to prepare to come home. So again, I go, that's interesting. If I believe him regarding his testimony and what he saw in the Book of Mormon, 
I can say with all surety he was off on this part, right? Because 170 years later, the ten tribes haven't returned, and Jesus hasn't returned, and the millennium hasn't been ushered in in Missouri. And so he was certainly mistaken about that. If he was mistaken about that, is it possible that he was mistaken about the rest as well? One other of the few other interesting accounts comes from Thomas Ford, who was the governor of Illinois from 1843 to 1847. And the reason he has so much intimate knowledge of this is the saints eventually go from Kirtland to Missouri, and they run out of Missouri, and they end up in Nauvoo, Illinois. The church continues to grow. And in the early 1840s, Nauvoo, Illinois was the second largest city in Illinois behind only Chicago. So growing rapidly and a lot of political power and a lot of political clout. They were a big city, and it led to all sorts of problems that he had to deal with as governor. Like, they're establishing their own militia in Nauvoo, Illinois, and raising their own army, right? That's for him as the governor. I'm trying to keep the peace, and he's in the middle of all of this. And um, so he had a lot of knowledge with the Mormons in that time period. And after he left office, he wrote a history of Illinois, from when Illinois was founded until 1847. And so he mentions the, the LDS Church quite a bit in there. And regarding the eight witnesses, this is what he said. The most probable account of these certificates, and he's talking about that testimony statement of the eight in the Book of Mormon, that the, is that the witnesses were in conspiracy aiding the imposter. But I have been informed by men who were once in the confidence of the prophet that he privately gave a different account of the matter. It's related that the prophet's early followers were anxious to see the plates. The prophet had always given out that they couldn't be seen by the carnal eye, but must be spiritually discerned. That the power to see them depended on faith and was a gift of God to be exercised by fasting and prayer, mortification of the flesh, and exercises of the spirit. That so soon as he could see the evidence of a strong and lively faith, any of his followers, they could be gratified in their holy curiosity. He set them to continual prayer and other spiritual exercises to acquire this faith by means of which the hidden things of God could be spiritually discerned. All right, that's a big mouthful. But basically, he was told from those on the inside that Joseph Smith had said, you have to see him through the power of faith and you've got to have enough faith. When he could delay them no longer, he assembled them in a room and produced a box which he said contained the precious treasure. The lid was opened, the witnesses peeped into it, but making no discovery, for the box was empty, they said, Brother Joseph, we don't see the plates. The prophet answered them, O ye of little faith, how long will God bear with this wicked and perverse generation? Down on your knees, brethren, every one of you, and pray God for forgiveness of your sins and for a holy and living faith which cometh down from heaven. The disciples dropped to their knees and began to pray in the fervency of the Spirit, supplicating God for more than two hours with fanatical earnestness, at the end of which time, looking again in the box, they were now persuaded that they saw the plates. And I leave it to the philosophers to determine how all of that might have sorted out. Now, and, and to be sure, this is a third-hand account uh, that he is passing on. This is what I heard. Uh, he is saying, and I heard from people who were close. But giving other th given everything else that we have seen, I can see how that would be very, very possible. That you got them so whipped up and so convinced that you convinced them they saw something when maybe they hadn't. I don't know. And again, I go, you can see how I go. It's hard to put all these different pieces together with what actually went down. But I can at least see um, some version of that. We also have the difficulty, and I'm going to go through this quick because we looked at it a couple weeks ago with the three witnesses that you might recall Martin Harris came right out and said the eight witnesses never saw or physically handled the plates. Um, this is what Martin Harris said in 1838, and again, he had left the church over the Kirtland banking scandal, and he stood up in a meeting and said this, according to Stephen Burnett, who was writing to Lyman Johnson, who was one of the 12 apostles at the time. Burnett said, I have reflected long and deliberately upon the history of this church and weighed the evidence for it and against it. I'm loath to give it up. I don't want to give it up. I've believed this, and it's hard to admit you're wrong when you believe something to be true. 
He says, I don't want to give it up, but when I came to hear Martin Harris state in public that he never saw the plates with his natural eye, only in vision or imagination, neither Oliver Cowdery nor David Whitmer, and also that the eight witnesses never saw them and hesitated to sign that instrument for that reason. That they, he's, Harris said they were hesitant to sign that statement because they had never actually seen them but they were persuaded to do it. The last pedestal gave away, and our foundation was sapped, and the entire structure fell in a heap of ruins. Uh, Warren Parrish, who was a leader in the church at the time, uh, wrote a letter in the same time period in 1838 where he backs up what Burnett had said, that Martin Harris publicly said he never saw the plates, and that any man who says he has seen them in anything other than a vision is a liar. And so we have corroborating testimony of Harris making these, these statements that nobody's ever actually physically seen the plates for themselves. So you put all that together. Where does that leave us? I don't know. I think I, I see several possibilities in this. Uh, I think possibility number one is there may be something to Governor Ford's claim that he talked them into believing that they saw something when there wasn't actually anything there. Um, I, it's possible that all eight of them lied, and they were just persuaded to sign a statement that they knew wasn't true. I think it's also possible that Joseph Smith actually had something that he showed them, um, that he actually came up with some kind of plates that were enough to convince them. I don't know. Uh, where I land in all that when you put these pieces together, it's hard to know. But I do know their lives, after they said they saw the plates, um, I think say a lot. Um, so just a quick timeline of the eight. Christian Whitmer um, and Peter Whitmer both died young and very early on. We don't have anything from them. Um, both died just a few years after the church was founded. Joseph Smith Sr., who was a member of the first presidency and was named the first patriarch of the church, right? This is the prophet's dad. He was kind of a big deal. It's surprising to me that we don't have anything from him, uh, but he died in Illinois in 1840. Hiram Smith was an apostle and the second patriarch of the church and the assistant president of the church uh, in, in the later years before Smith passed away. He died with Joseph Smith um, in when a mob stormed the prison in Carthage, Missouri, where he and Joseph were awaiting trial. So he died with Joseph. Uh, we have very little from him. The other witness, Samuel Smith, uh, their brother, he was actually on his way to Carthage uh, when he got roughed up by uh, another mob. Um, and possible, some people think he might have been injured in that, um, but he died... Um, we just know he got sick about a month later, and he passed away as well. Hiram Page went on to have nine kids. He became part of the dissenters when John was excommunicated from the church. So he left the church and said Joseph Smith was a false prophet. He later joined McClellan's church. He never denied his testimony that we're aware of, but he also went to his grave, uh, never rejoining the church and saying that the church uh, was false. He died in a farming accident in 1852. Jacob Whitmer also had nine kids, and he also left the church in 1838. And again, he never denied his testimony, but he never rejoined the church. John Whitmer was a pretty big deal early on. He was the first official historian of the church. They said he was excommunicated in 1838 in part of the Kirtland banking scandal. He joined the dissenters. He stayed in far west Missouri for the rest of his life, became a very prosperous farmer, eventually owned over 625 acres, and uh, including he bought the site where the temple was supposed to be built. And after the Mormons were run out of Missouri, far west, which had been a pretty good-sized town, became a ghost town and because they'd all gone to Nauvoo, and he would do tours uh, later in life um, for people coming through studying the history of the church. He never rejoined the church either, and he lived until 1878. What's interesting, though, is after all those people left the church, where they went. 
Uh, after Joseph Smith was killed in 1844, we've talked about Drain, James Strang briefly before, they had what's called the succession crisis because he left no clear successor behind and he died unexpectedly. And so there was no clear successor and there was no clear mode of succession. And so you had this huge crisis. Um, eventually, the biggest branch, they all followed Brigham Young as the successor. And, you know, we know the rest of the story. Brigham Young brought him out here. But initially, James Strang was a strong candidate. And he's an interesting guy because he'd only been a part of the church for a few months, but he got close to Joseph Smith really fast. And he claimed to be the prophet to succeed him. And he produced this letter from Joseph Smith that was written a week before his death saying, Joseph Smith appointed me to be his heir. And there's a lot of controversy surrounding this letter then and now, whether Joseph Smith actually wrote it. And one thing we do know for sure is that it was sent from Nauvoo um, to Wisconsin um, a week before Joseph Smith died. So we do know it came from the right town. It's not clear whether Joseph Smith actually penned the letter or not. But he convinced a lot of people that he had, regardless. The interesting thing is we know now that Strang's motivations, we know he was a fraud, and we know that he knew that he was a fraud. Because um, we have his journals that he was a Mason, and they're written in the Masonic Code, and it wasn't just deciphered until the 1950s. But when that was finally translated, he said things like this in his journal, that Joseph Smith calls on me to pray and talk religious subjects, and sometimes I consent just to please the people. It's all a mere cock of, mock of sounds for me, for I can no longer believe the nice speculative contradictions of our divine theologians of our age. He said the dreams of empire, of having power, um, run so th are so thoroughly imprinted on my mind as not to be easily erased, but I am a perfect atheist. And I do not confess it, lest I bring my father gray hair with sorrow to the grave. So he was a fraud, and we know that he knew that he was a fraud. And he became the contender to lead the church when Joseph Smith died. To add weight, he had the letter. He said, an angel also appeared to me. And then he went farther, like Smith. He said, God had revealed to him, revealed to him the location of another record of an ancient lost civilization, just like Joseph Smith. And he revealed the exact location of the buried plates. And unlike Joseph Smith, when he uncovered them, he took his four witnesses with him. And they dug up the plates together. And then he actually published, he, he found these plates that became known as the Vori plates, actually displayed them publicly in a museum uh, for a while. And they became known as the Vori plates. And then like Smith, he claimed the ability to translate these ancient records and they were lost somewhere around the turn of the last century in the early 1900s. And so we don't know where the actual plates are today, but we have this facsimile of the record of Raja Manchu of Rito, which has these symbols on it, and he claimed to be able to translate them. And he had his own witness statements at the beginning of his book that he published, and they're arguably more credible than Smith's because each clearly testified to physically seeing plates and what happened and how it all went down. Each physically signed the witness statement with a date and a location and all of that. So if you're just weighing evidence against evidence, we have better evidence for his witnesses than we do the Book of Mormon witnesses. And again, he displayed them for the public, for everybody to go see. It was eventually published as the Book of the Law of the Lord, and it was another, it was an account it was laws that God gave Moses that were placed in the Ark of the Covenant with the Pentateuch, um, but that when the Israelites were taken into captivity by the Babylonians, the record became lost, but Nephi had a copy that he brought with him to the New World. And the Nephites preserved them, and then he found them and translated them. Here's his witness statement that's at the beginning of the book of the law of the Lord. And I'll read it quickly just because tell me how if this sounds familiar. <laughs> Be it known unto all nations, kindreds, hugs, and people to whom the book of the law of the Lord shall come that James Strang has the plates of the ancient book of the law of the Lord given to Moses from which he translated this law and has shown them to us. We examined them with our eyes and handled them with our hands. The engravings are beautiful antique workmanship bearing a striking resemblance to the ancient oriental languages um, 
and he translated all of these books, and we testify that it's true, and then there's the names of his witnesses. All sounds vaguely familiar, doesn't it? Here's why all of this is interesting. John Whitmer, David Whitmer, Martin Harris, Hiram Page, John Page, William Smith, Emma Hale Smith, Joseph Smith's first wife, uh, all of Joseph Smith's sisters, Lucy Mack Smith, Joseph Smith's mom, were all convinced that Strang was a prophet and joined his movement. All of the living Book of the Mormon Witnesses, uh, Book of Mormon Witnesses, when Joseph Smith died, all of those who were still alive, with the exception of Oliver Cowdery, all of the witnesses, as well as most of Smith's family, joined Strang's movement and believed he was a prophet. By 19, 1847, not a single one of the surviving witnesses was affiliated with the Mormon church. Which leads me to go, how is it? These are the people I'm supposed to take, take, place my trust in as a credible witness. How is it that they could all be so easily convinced by a false prophet who was essentially selling the same thing, rehashed that Joseph Smith had been selling, doing the same exact thing? Um, Strang's movement, eventually, he had, at one point he had over 12,000 followers. He established a new community on Beaver Island in Michigan, and we're saying the same things. Is where Jesus is going to return, right? And um, um, it, it eventually kind of all fell apart. There are still about 300 Strangites today who believe he was a prophet and believe follow the book of the law of the Lord. But if I were to believe the testimony of the eight witnesses is based essentially on one printed statement in the front of the Book of Mormon, am I also supposed to believe the testimony of Strang's witnesses? who actually provide more corroboration for their testimony than the Book of Mormon witnesses do. If I'm going to believe one, why don't I believe the other? And it's interesting to me that uh, LDS apologists today go to a great deal of effort and trouble to try to discredit Strang's witnesses. Well, why don't you just accept their statement as being true, if you'll accept these as being true? And so it seems to me that leads to a lot of difficulty uh, there. So in the end, I'll have to leave it to you to decide. Do you think the testimony of the eight witnesses are credible or not? Um, I can't go there. I'll admit, I don't know exactly what it all went down. I don't know how exactly it all went down. I don't know if they thought they saw something. I don't know if Joseph Smith made something that he actually showed them and there was something physical that they saw. I don't know if all of them were lying. Uh, I, don't, I don't know which one of those conflicting accounts is how it actually all played out. I wish I did, and I wish I could say with certainty this is what happened. But at least I can't. I'm not confident enough in any of that to go, I think this is what happened. But I do know that based on the evidence that we have, and when you add that to everything we've looked at in the past 13 weeks, there's nothing in that testimony of eight witnesses that convinces me, oh yeah, this is the truth, and I'm going to put all my faith and trust in that testimony when you look at all of the evidence as a whole. I will leave it up to you to decide uh, from there. Next week, I'm excited, because next week you're going to go, hallelujah. Next week, we finally jump back into our historical timeline where April 1830, Joseph Smith founded the church. We will start going back through the timeline. How did we get from there to where we are today? So be back next Sunday, and I'm excited about that. Let's pray together.